Welcome to Intimate Conversations with Frances O'Brien, healing one heart at a time. Thank you so much for joining me once again on my channel. It has been a while. A lot has happened, I must say, but I just want to give glory to God for you know, um, the difficult times and for getting us through difficult times. It's a beautiful Sunday afternoon. It's a lovely time. And just so you know, as I was about to intro, those squawking birds, those birds, they just, and I'm like, you know what? I am not having you on my intro. Forget that. So I'm like, hmm, waiting, waiting. And it was like a whole <laughs> A whole flock of birds just decided to say, you know what, we're going to ambush this, you know, this, this area for a specific amount of time. But anyway, getting that out the way, thank you so much for tuning in and for joining me on Intimate Conversations with Francis O'Brien. And by the grace of God, healing one heart at a time. Now, today is going to be a bit of a serious video, as is the rest of my videos. Funny enough, I actually was thinking of doing a bit of a mukbang, but I thought, hmm... Mukbang with the kind of content that I'm doing might not be quite a perfect blend But if you guys would like to see me do that, then just let me know and leave a comment in the subscription or rather in the comment section below and um, I'll see how many people are interested in seeing me doing a mukbang but um, I think for the purposes of the content and um, for what God has put in my heart I think um, it might be a little bit of a contrast, perhaps a separate channel may be befitting. So um, this video, um, you know, has really been inspired by two events, actually, two events um, that had just, you know, happened not too long ago, or that I had just watched on television not too long ago. And um, it's really sad. Um, it's really, really sad. Uh, today's topic that I'm going to be talking about is emotional and psychological abuse or emotional and or um, psychological abuse. That's what I'm going to be talking about today. And this video, I'm wearing black, so this video is actually dedicated to the movement that's happening in South Africa against um, gender-based violence because it's been really, it's unbelievable. The more, it's like the more there's awareness of it, the more the attacks are getting frequent and you really wonder are people not hearing the message are people not understanding so there was a petition or a lot of women just you know put it across to uh, the presidency that if this issue is not dealt with um you know harshly then for such especially for such heinous crimes then they're going to take matters into their own hands and i've watched a lot of documentaries on gender-based violence and all I can say is we live in a very traumatized world. We live in a, a world, I remember posting on Facebook and I said, we live in a world that is full of broken people. That's the best way I can put it. This world is filled with broken people. It's filled with hurt people. It's filled with abused people. And it's full of people that have low self-esteem, that have no self-worth. And everything that's negative that could possibly happen to a human being and it seems to be getting on the on the increase and I'm, I'm i'm really trying to understand is it that now these things are beginning to manifest and people were quiet about them for a very long time and everybody was hiding and living under a, a kind of pretense bubble and now people are showing themselves who are showing who they really are i really don't know what's making them you know these kinds of violent attacks against women more rampant against women and children i must be specific so um there was a movement and the women decided to wear black on Friday. Uh, today's Sunday. They decided to wear black on Friday as a movement. They marched, I think, in Santon City, Johannesburg, um, you know, to the CEO, I think, towards Johannesburg Stock Exchange, um, you know, just to put this uh, movement across because we are calling out for harsher terms. We are calling out for harsher sentences, rather, towards men and their abusive tendencies towards women like the violence is just unbelievable and you know the the number of young women that go missing and the brutal murders and rapes that are done on these women isn't is just something that is just it leaves you speechless 
it leaves you terrified as a woman it leaves you unnerved as a citizen to think okay but if there are no harsher sentences towards these perpetrators for these heinous crimes that means they can walk around rampant so today's topic which is on emotional and psychological abuse is another form of abuse and the reason why i've decided to cover this is this is because it's something i know too well i know it very very well and if you've listened or if you haven't listened to my life story please make sure that you look on the on my videos on my channel and you'll see my life story part one and part two and i give a description or rather i give a, um, uh, um, a narration on my life story and what i went through in a nutshell so all the videos that you will see um you know that i'll be uploading are based on my history and who better to tell it than myself so this is what i just want to share with you and um emo emotional abuse is very difficult to explain n n no less express and i guess it's the same with um sexual abuse and physical abuse emotional abuse is very different because it there are no scars there's no physical evidence that you can see on an individual's body and um i will sit here today and i will say that i am an emotional abuse survivor and the reason why i could say that is because the actually this video was motivated by two things it was motivated by two things and you know with emotional abuse it keeps the victim trapped in a relationship I guess this is the same way with, um, you know, physical abuse as well as sexual abuse. But I will talk more on emotional abuse. Emotional abuse keeps the victim trapped in a very toxic situation, stroke relationship that the victim feels that they cannot live without the abuser. And it's really sad. It's really sad how we as women get so abused to the point that we feel so trapped in these relationships and we can't get out of them. And we feel that, especially with emotional abuse, like I said, there's no, there's no evidence. And it's not something that you can say, yeah, you know, he's emotionally abusing me. And even if I do say it, it doesn't carry that much weight. But unlike if I tell you I'm being physically abused or being um, sexually abused. And I feel that when somebody says to you, I am emotionally abused, it's something that needs to be taken seriously. Emotionally abused people, you know, it, it, it affects their, their functionality. It affects their mental state of being. And these are individuals that turn out into becoming uh, sexual offenders, into becoming physical abusers, because emotionally you are tormented to the point that you don't know who you are your sense of identity is completely lost and especially if this happens to you at a very young age it alters your personality and your character significantly when you now grow up into an adult now um emotional abuse is so grave because it takes place over long periods of time it's not a short period of time that you can emotionally abuse somebody naturally if somebody emotionally abuses you you would automatically pick that and call that person to order when you pick it up the thing is especially when it comes into a relationship you know an emotional abuser will say very harsh comments to you and then turn around and do completely nice things just like a narcissist would do actually it is one of the narcissistic uh, tendencies or characteristics if you hear the drilling in the background, please forgive me. I think there's maintenance going on in the complex. I don't know how long that's going to be. It's been between yesterday and today. And I cannot pause my content for the sake of that drilling. So please bear with me for the rest of the, um, for the duration of this video. Um, so they turn around and they do something completely nice, which throws you off balance and it throws you off guard because you think, okay, then this person is nice. They probably just had a bad day and you forgive the person, right? They wake up the following day or the following week, they do something else completely different. Then you justify it and you make an excuse for it. Or they may even apologize for it. And you think, you know what, I can tolerate this. Or, uh, you know, I can deal with this. It's not as bad because it's not physical abuse and it's not sexual abuse. 
but you don't know that the damage on your mind is just as bad. It's just as bad. I think even, you know, I was speaking to my mom not too long ago and she said to me, you know, sexual violence is, you know, just, or sexual abuse is just as bad because not only are you now oppressed physically, but you've been oppressed physically. Uh, I mean, mentally, but you are, you're oppressed physically. And this person has completely got you under such a, a powerful lock that you can't even escape. And some, it's worse if it's not even one person and it's many. And, you know, when I sat about it, sudden I thought about it and I've heard so many, you know, um, testimonies and stories on women who have given accounts on their, on their sexual abuse. It's a very traumatic experience. It's very traumatic. With emotional abuse, it's very difficult for you to even say it's traumatic. Here's the funny, the sad part. With emotional abuse, you only understand the impact of what was done to you once you are out of that relationship and like i said on this channel i will always talk about relationships um you know i'm not going to talk about um anything else i'm not a psychologist i'm not a psychiatrist i'm just talking from personal experience um you only understand the gravity of what was done to you when you are now out of the relationship now, the only evidence that can be seen with an, a person that's been emotionally abused is the change in character. And most times it's a change in character for the worse. It's not a constructive change. It's a deconstructive change. And most times a person, be, if you were in, extroverted before, you become an introvert. And if you were introverted before, you become an extrovert. But you become an extreme of whatever it is you morph into. Now, two things inspired me to do this video. And I'm going to try and be as fast as I possibly can. I'm 12 minutes in. Now, two things inspired me to do this particular video. The third, obviously, being the movement with the gender-based violence that has been happening. Number one was, let me read it properly. I was watching the surviving R. Kelly at the Impact docuseries on television. And a number of women had come out to share their stories about the abuse that they experienced in the hands of R. Kelly and how he sexually and emotionally abused them. And automatically you can detect emotional abuse in their stories. When you're a victim of abuse, you can see another victim because you can relate to what it is that they're saying because you have been in it and you've experienced it. So when these women were giving their stories, I could relate. It got to a point where some of these women, uh, you know, w confessed that they were even emotionally, they were justifying what he was doing. The ones that really shocked me the most, and I felt sorry for the most, were his two girlfriends who ended up staying with him. And they were young women. They have got no idea what this man has done, this man is doing to them. Because they're only going to feel that impact when they're not out of the relationship. And it's going to be very difficult for these ladies if they don't receive counseling and they don't receive the, you know, the necessary help to have very healthy relationships. Now, with emotional abuse, this can affect you, your relationships at work. It can affect your relationships with your friends. It can relation, affect your relationships with your partner even. Especially if you have had a past relationship with somebody who was abusive to you. Now, when I watched these ladies, you know, um, what I didn't like was the public outcry that came towards these women because they were, their testimonies or their stories were doubted because some of these women came out after 10 years, after 15 years. You know, when I watched these videos and I looked at these women giving their stories, I truly understood why it takes time. For somebody to come out and tell you that I, I'm, I'm, I'm a sexual abuse victim, I'm a physical abuse victim, or I'm an emotional abuse victim. And like I say, I, I, I feel so compelled to talk about emotional abuse because it's something that you cannot see. It is something that you experience. It's something that you feel. And it's, it's so sad because there's no evidence. And half the time you are made to look like a liar. Half the time you're made to look like you're losing your mind. Half the time you're made to look like you are really making up stories. 
And I don't know what kind of sick person would really, de you know, uh, derive pleasure from making up horrid stories about being abused. Unless if you really have a mental problem and you're looking for attention in the worst way possible. And I understood that, unfortunately, it's it's this is not only a very personal ordeal, but it's difficult to narrate because as you narrate this pain, as with all the other forms of abuse, you literally relive everything that was said to you, everything that was done, the experiences, the feelings, the emotions that come with the trauma that you pass through is a reliving and you choke up and you shut down and you don't say anything. And, you know, it's, it's humiliating. It's not a comfortable conversation to have at all because very, because you fear criticism and you fear judgment. You fear criticism and you fear judgment. It's difficult to admit to somebody, especially, I mean, with all the, as well as all the other forms of abuse, it's very difficult to admit to somebody that you were controlled. You know, with the other forms of violence, you literally have no, you have per se no um, strength to fight back because you're generally overpowered by this person or you're manipulated by this person. With emotional abuse, no one is touching you. No one is holding you. No one is forcing you. You are being coerced day after day after day into doing things you don't like or that are not comfortable for you, into um, saying things that you don't like that aren't even comfortable with you. And that's a form of control. That's a narcissistic tendency. It's a control that makes you completely doubt your reality. That's the power of emotional abuse. How can I say to you, if, I, if I'm your girlfriend, or if I'm your friend, if I'm a colleague, I, how will I come to you and say, I'm being emotionally abused? Because first thing, like, that face in itself, what do you mean you're being emotionally abused? Now, that is such a simple question, but the response is like this much. And are you patient enough, you the person who's hearing the news or you the recipient, are you patient enough to hear me tell you what I have to tell you? And that's once. Two, am I strong enough to narrate everything that I've been through to you? And are you willing to listen to me? Are you willing, are you going to believe me when I tell you what has happened to me? And three, what advice would you possibly give me? Sometimes we don't even want advice. We just want somebody to share this with because we're trying to understand if this is normal and if this should be tolerated, you know. And I completely understand why some of these women... Look, I've been in a... The relationship that I passed through, which is extremely traumatic, was for over 14 years. I separated from this person almost over two years ago and I am just talking about it <laughs> I am just talking about it and I promise you I didn't even want to talk about it but because when God delivers you from a situation what you go through and hear me very clearly on this what you go through in your life is not for you it's for somebody else it's for the liberation of other people you are doing it to empower other people. You're doing it to save other people. You're doing it to heal other people. God has given you the strength to endure everything that you went through. Because when he brings you out, he will take the glory for him delivering you from that situation. I really did not. I'm a very private person. I did not want to talk about this. I really didn't want to talk about it. But God encouraged me or motivated me to talk about this he really put it in my heart that you have to talk about this because what you went through not many women would have survived some women would have contemplated suicide it's emotionally traumatic it's emotionally tra traumatic the other thing i came to realize is that when you pass through a is that when you go through this kind of abuse over a long period of time you begin to be numb and you live in denial you begin to be numb and you begin to be to live in denial. You don't process the pain, so you therefore live in a survival mode. So what you do is when something traumatic happens to you, especially emotionally, this is an emotional example. Um, 
you have a, a very explosive argument with your partner they say something completely out of you know uh, out of character completely unnecessary and it, it it really shocks you literally it physically shocks you and then your mind gets into this mode of i can't believe he just said that did this person just say that to me then what you do is that particular um, traumatic thought or, 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 or statement, you will shelf it somewhere in, you know, in, in, in a part of your brain. You will shelf it, you will not think about it, and you will not want to process it. So that's the part where I'm saying you become numb and you become, you live in denial. And you, you are now in survival mode because it's like, I'm going to fight for my right. I'm going to defend myself. I'm going to, you know, put my statement across. Sometimes you're not even successful enough to put your statement across because it's shut down immediately. So you don't have a thought. You don't have a brain according to this person. And everything that comes out of your mouth is completely stupid. So when they make those statements, you, you get, you, you do ask, how can you say that to me? Then you keep quiet and you think, ah, whatever, and you dismiss it. That's if you're strong in character, you dismiss it. But here's the thing, in that strength, you are shelving that painful thing. You shelf it somewhere and you don't want to deal with it and you're in survival mode. So every day this person gets to say these very painful statements and they begin to say very hurtful things to you and do very hurtful things in your space and you shelf them, you shelf them and you shelf them and you shelf them. Now, you tell yourself as you're, sh you're shelving these, these episodes or deals, you're hoping to either deal with it at a later time or never deal or process what just happened to you ever again. Then you pass through the stage of disbelief. <laughs> and I pass this, th like I'm saying, everything I've written here is stuff that I literally went through. You pass through a stage of disbelief. You question how you were in that situation in the very first place. You try to understand why you were in that situation in the first place. And here's the honest truth. There are a number of reasons. And I mean degree, social standing, um, whatever you are in society, you are not exempt from any kind of abuse. It can happen to almost anybody. It can happen to the best of us. It can happen to the worst of us. So there is no, the only thing is, when you believe that you are in a social standing and people, uh, you know, uh, admire you and they, 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 um, they praise you. And then you go home to get somebody who does not even acknowledge your very existence. That in itself is completely traumatic. That's where you get into the beliefs, disbelief stage. Cause you're like, if people can think of me like this on the outside, how am I in this situation? How did I find myself here? How did I even get here? Because people tell me I've got such a strong personality. How did I get here? Now, there's a really big problem with bearing pain. And like I said, you don't have a choice. Sometimes you're operating in survival mode. So you will bury pain. Now, the painful part about bearing pain is it resurfaces and at most times it's, it surfaces in unexpected surroundings or at inappropriate times, or and inappropriate times in front of the most, in front of people that you really respect, that pain resurfaces. And you can have something trigger that buried memory. It could be a statement by somebody close to you. It could be an action by somebody close to you that triggers something that that person did to you and you will have an outburst. And that outburst sometimes is because you wish you could have responded that way to the person that, that actually did that to you to offend you um, in your personal space. But here you are completely reacting in an, you know, in an inappropriate manner amongst people that you really shouldn't be behaving like that in front of ideally now the thing is you'll get the looks as in uh okay what was that and it's too late to redeem yourself because you've already exploded it's really painful and it's very difficult and i've had that episode or those episodes before where somebody does something or says something and they are genuine in their statement and they really don't mean anything by what they said and I took it, man. I took it. It's sad. It's really sad. Having those kinds of overreactions or outbursts in, you know, 
and in and, and they're uncontrollable because it's like a volcano that is simmering on the inside just waiting to erupt and after that it's uncontrollable and unstoppable crying if you are a crier but i believe you know most women do eventually cry they don't cry in front of people they will cry behind closed doors now i'm telling my story and my experience and i buried a lot of my pain because i had to put my feelings aside purely because i was concentrating on being a mother i had no time to process the the painful things that this person was telling me i had no time to process the the condescending remarks that this person was doing or passing towards me. I had no time to even concentrate on the infidelity. I was just concentrating on me being strong for my son and I, trying to shield him from a, a toxic environment that, you know, hope, hoping that he is not going to pick up on it. But I'm sorry, kids are very sharp. They're very receptive and very perceptive and they pick up on stuff. No matter how much you pretend, they will pass a comment one day and say, Mom or Dad, why did so-so and so do this? And you are left again trying to make an excuse. And the excuse is almost like a justification as to why that person did what they did. Right? So it makes one in so many ways, or rather it breaks, emotional abuse breaks a person in so many ways and it affects their functionality. It affects an individual's functionality. What I've realized that it, is that it's a very difficult thing to talk about, as I've mentioned, just like every other form of abuse. And it's difficult to tell someone as a grown woman or as a grown individual that somebody ha is controlling or has controlled, stroke, manipulated you. First of all, like I said, you will get the looks. Now, people wonder, and I had this before, when I used to talk about my pain, and people see me as this very strong woman. People wonder, but if if this is what you're going through and it's unhealthy for you, why are you in it? And when you sit and think about it, you think, yeah, why am I in it? Now, this is the interesting part. First of all, there's a few things. First of all, you're in it because you realize the guilt of your relationship. Failing is what is getting to you. Number two, your assumed love for the abuser, assumed love for the abuser. Your obligation to your children, your desire to want to make things work, no matter the cost. This is why you don't leave. And the fifth reason is your hope in thinking this person will change over time. But the question is, whose time are you wasting? Whose time are you passing? Whose clock are you using to gauge this person changing? So number one is the guilt. Like I said, the reasons for you not leaving is the guilt of your relationship failing, your assumed love for the abuser, your obligation to your children, your desire to want to make things work no matter the cost, and your desire to see the person change while you are still with them in that relationship or while you're dating. So most times the abuser may have such ugly words for you. For me, let me tell you, what my ex used to tell me, nonsense like, no, <laughs> And I can call it nonsense because I'm out of it. And I can see how much this person did. That's the other thing. You can only see it when you're now out of it. When you're in it, I promise you, you're in survival and you're in denial mode. Don't even get it twisted. You're in survival and you're in denial mode. He will tell me, do you know what a privilege it is to date me? There's so many women who are dying to be in your situation or to, who are dying to be in your position. Subconsciously, you think you're such an arrogant person. But for some odd reason, you'll find yourself working twice as hard and trying, you know, to really impress this individual to prove that they should be with you. I mean, really. It's only a broken person that can get to that kind of mindset. And I will agree that I was broken then. Excuse me, because why I should have seen my value. I should have seen my worth. If that person doesn't see it, then... They don't deserve me. They don't deserve me. But here I am trying to impress this person. The abuser sometimes, you know, and before I even go into that part, you work twice as hard to impress this person when they pass such condescending moments that you can't even cook. The chick I used to date before used to cook much better. Then you think, okay, if she used to cook much better, maybe I can cook better. You know, if she used to cook much better than I do, I should up my game. 
then I, I, you know, you start researching all these different recipes over the internet and you want to go for culinary schools. I mean, really, there's nothing wrong with you polishing your game. But if you're polishing a game to impress a dude that doesn't even care about you, first of all, why aren't you with your ex is what you should be asking yourself. Why aren't you with your ex who used to cook such culinary, culinary meals for you? Why using that to kind of, you know, judge me? Or did she see you for who you were? That's why you you ended up breaking up that type of thing so you work twice as hard to impress your abuser imagine how twisted that sounds and you you know you feed this is the part where i now get into spirituality you are feeding a demonic spirit that's what you need to understand you are feeding the ego of a demonic spirit now hear me carefully ladies i'm not saying that you must go back to your houses and go and call these your boyfriend's demons I never said that, and I'm not saying that, but it's a spirit. Whatever is inhabiting this person to, uh, you know, you know, in, inflict or impose such pain on you, that's a demonic spirit, especially when you find yourself trapped in it. The abuser sometimes knows what they're doing. Sometimes they don't know what they're doing. Now, obviously, if they know what they're doing, they are trying to break you down to get what it is that they want to get from you and then dispose of you. Sometimes they, to them as an abuser, they've just, they've grown up with this kind of abuse and that's the only thing they know. To them, it's, it feels right. It's the right thing to do. And changing that mindset is, 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 is going to be quite a difficult and arduous task. And I don't know if you are equipped as a, an individual to kind of help this person change their mindset because they've already changed your mindset. All right. So um, if they're doing what that was done to them, they will believe that how they're thinking, acting or behaving is completely right. It's completely correct. And you obviously as the abused will see everything wrong with what they're doing and how they're treating you. It's very heavy and it's an oppressive spirit and that spirit captures your spirit. You must understand that it puts your spirit in bondage. If you are not strong enough, this is where you completely morph. You change. You completely change. Your personality will change. Your physical appearance will even change. Whether you will gain weight or you will lose weight. Whether you have really bad skin or you won't, but you will change. That's when you know that you are in the presence of a very evil spirit that has captured you. You know, when you're out of the house, like in my case, when I used to leave the house, I can't tell you, man, I would feel this relief. I'd be so happy to be out of the house. And, I, you know, my, I'd almost feel like my personality is coming back. So basically, it's like I open the door, my personality is waiting for me outside. And then it's a road that I clothe myself or I drape myself in and I'm myself. And then I go out and I feel like I can conquer the world. When it's when I'm at work, man, and it's close to knockoff time, I don't know. You just feel your energy dissipating as you get closer and closer to your domain. You just dread opening that door, seeing this person going through all these arguments and fights and that heavy atmosphere, that toxic environment, not only for you, but for your children, the pretense that you have to, you know, uh, uh, um, drape yourself in just to survive. And once you get back into and just on your way home, already you get into a depressed state of mind. You get into a depressed state of mind. That's how you know you're operating with a spirit and an evil spirit. It's not rocket science. It's a toxic environment for you. It's a toxic environment for your mother. It's a toxic environment for your children. Now, and it also makes you sad most of the time. You know, you lose your hope, you lose your creativity, you lose your spark. That's why I said you morph into somebody else because you are in a completely depressed and oppressive environment. You will change. You will definitely change. Now, one thing I'm grateful for is despite the fact that I found myself in a situation, I still went to church. And I think that is what gave me strength each and every day. And I was part of the band and I used to sing in the choir or in the church band. And we would do extreme prayers, praying against demonic spirits and praying against, you know, um, principalities and, and rulers of the darkness of this world. And we would really pray 
fervently and we would fast. And I realized that uh, coming out of it, that God equipped me to stay there as long as I could. Guys, I promise you, if you're not praying, you will not survive it. And I don't mean to be so pessimistic, but you will not survive. If you are not praying to God to deliver you from that situation, you, you may not survive. You really may not survive. So moving along, here's the odd part or the queer part about this whole thing. You actually realize or you, you, you actually know that the relationship you're in is very toxic. You know it. You can't even, some people, yes, may be in denial and that is them denying because they don't want to accept the truth that what the situation they're in is very toxic for them. Sometimes you actually know it's very toxic. You know you're very toxic, but then it gets to, yes, I know this is bad, but how am I going to get out of it? What am I going to do? Sometimes it's life-threatening. Literally for me, it was life-threatening. I would get those, you know, those comments that, hmm, like I said in my life story, so you think you're going to take my son and you'll go and live with another man and have a happy life. It will never happen, not while I'm alive. And like I said, I didn't take his threats lightly. I knew he would live on his threats. I knew. And it, th there would be a loss in whatever it is that he decided to do. So when you find yourself debating on leaving, you know that this person doesn't value you, this person doesn't respect you, and this person definitely doesn't know your worth. But despite the fact that you know this, you still won't leave. Like for the many, like for the five reasons that I gave earlier on in the video. Now, Jesus Christ says that I came that you may have life and have life abundantly. The thing is, ladies and gentlemen, if you're going through this, you have every right to live a happy, a healthy and a successful life. When Jesus died on the cross, he didn't die for one person. He died for everybody. He died for his children, for God's children, to be free. By his wounds, we are healed. So every hatred, every evil thing that was said to him, every terrible thing that was ever done to him physically, even emotionally, he felt it and he died for us. Do not go through that. You need to understand that. That's why his sacrifice was the ultimate sacrifice. It was the ultimate. For God to send a fleshly form of himself on this earth to feel everything, to hear everything that human beings go through, just goes to show you how much God is loving. And I had to, I think I heard that in when I was still staying in you know, in that relationship, in, in the previous residence with this person. Like I said, my prayer life is what helped give me strength to get through this. I realized that God really loves me. And you have to know that. Before you even love yourself, first tell yourself that God loves me. If this person doesn't value you, God values you. If he says he knew you before you were even formed in your mother's womb, he knows you. So everything you are going through, everything you're feeling. I don't like it when pastors preach and they say, yeah, God is not moved by tears. I'm very sorry. It is a big lie. Every pastor who says that you have no right to say that and you are contradicting what the Bible says because when the Israelites in Egypt were crying, God said, Tell my people I have heard their cry and I have come to deliver them. So when you are at night crying on your knees, you must know and you must believe that there is a God who hears your cry and he will deliver you from that. He will deliver you from it. Especially when your cry is, God, deliver me from it. I want out and I used to cry. Yeah, if my tears would have filled up a, a dam or a lake, I really don't know what size in this world would have had the capacity to feel. But I cried. I cried for God to deliver me from the situation that I found myself in, to, or rather found myself in. Now, 
here's the part where you need to do your part as well. So even if you've cried out and God is, is going to deliver you, that one you must know for sure. It's not going to happen at your time. That's another thing. You have to fight for yourself. You have to want a better life for yourself. You have to need it like the air you breathe. I don't see it, but I need it. That's for sure. I don't see it, but I need it. You have to need that air that you don't see to breathe, to survive, to live. So you have to need a life that you want, that you deserve. You have to want it with everything in your being. God needs to see it. Like he says, if you would just have faith like a mustard seed, just have that faith. He will do the rest. He will do the rest. It's a great spiritual battle. That one you must understand as well. It's a great and a deep spiritual battle that you're fighting and you can't do it without God's help. Don't even think, especially with things of the spirit. Like he says in his word, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. So if you're not wrestling against flesh and blood, clearly you are wrestling against the spirits, entities. And you can't do this by yourself. You, you definitely cannot do this by yourself. In my case, I wanted out, but I was concerned. I was truly concerned about my son. And I thought if I leave, that means I risk leaving my son. That means I risk having another woman look after my son. And I can't have that. And my son at the time, like I told you, was sick. Which other woman is going to care? Sometimes as women, we're also dodgy. I'm sorry, but we're shady. Sometimes we feel like, yes, I've got an open arms. I've got, you know, I'm going to love another man's woman or another man's child. When that child comes up in your space, child, you misbehave and you behave. You, you begin to be something else, which I don't understand sometimes. I really don't understand why we change and we become that. So sometimes you may be in such deep bondage that literally God will be the one to pull you out. When I say this, meaning you may try to fight to come out on your own and it doesn't work. God will literally, in his infinite mercy, will reach out and pull you out himself. He will pull you out himself. And it's only the hand of God that can deliver you. You know, sometimes when I say it in this case, meaning you, you feel like you can't leave. You, you just feel stuck and you're getting worse and you're deteriorating as a person, as an individual. You're just getting worse and worse by the day. And even if you cry, you still don't have that strength. Some demonic spirits are so powerful. They are absolutely oppressive. They are so oppressive. They are numbing. They are paralyzing. That's the word I need. They are paralyzing these spirits. And it can only take God to a mighty hand to compel a situation to change. In the Bible, the time where Moses had to go and where God sent Moses to deliver the Israelites, and God hardened, ha, God hardened Pharaoh's heart. In, the, in that particular story, there's a scripture that says that Pharaoh's hand, heart would not be moved unless a mighty hand compelled him. Now, God had to put all those kinds of afflictions upon the Egyptians. Nothing happened to the Israelites. And that was a mighty hand moving. Because Pharaoh thought he was a god. And he thought he could do as he pleased and he liked. Now, that's how some men behave in their relationships. They behave like Pharaohs, even to their wives. They believe they can do, they can behave, they can say as they please. It's like they are gods over your life. And I'm sorry, there's only one God over everybody's life as far as I'm concerned. And that's the Alpha and the Omega, Almighty God, the one who dwells in heaven. There is no other person that should be exhibiting themselves as a God over your life. Now, with all of this that had happened, that's when Pharaoh realized these kinds of anomalies or these kinds of mysterious um, happenings were bigger than even he was, were bigger than even his magicians or his oracles for that matter. And that's what compelled him eventually to say, you know what, go. The one that paralyzed him was the killing of the firstborns. I mean, there's no oracle on the planet that can exhibit that kind of mass murder. Not, not one can exhibit that kind of mass murder at the same time. There's nothing like that. So when you realize that something is bigger than you, 
you will bow to it. As his word says, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So when you are in an oppressive situation, God will see that my child is trapped and I need to move my child out of the situation. I cannot afford to lose my child. And it's case specific. And the thing is, when we as Christians, God does not have time. That's what you must know. He, he, he lives in an infinite world. So when we say you must do it now and you think you wake up in the morning, you know, in, in the morning, and poof, you teleport to it. It doesn't work like that. There's things that God has to set in motion before you move. What he needs is for you to trust him. What he needs is for you to believe in him. What he needs is for you to obey him. If he says he will do it, he will do it. And you must believe in those situations, he will always find his servants or somebody to, excuse me, to convey a message to you or to pass a message to you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Once more, it could be even, you could go to the grocery store and the cashier could say something completely random and you're like, uh, okay, whatever. But you don't know that that's how God works. He, used the he uses the foolish to make sense, to achieve his purpose. So don't ever think whatever situation you are in is just for nobody knows about it god doesn't know and he doesn't care he knows and he cares trust and believe that god knows and you care then he cares and i passed through that stage but it was only brief like i said sometimes you feel because your prayers are not answered you think this man really does not care but things have to be in motion people have to be in your life people have to be at a specific time that will come in to rescue you and that was my case that was my case I had to wait all these years to meet a specific individual that God was going to use to help me get out of this ordeal. And remember, I also wanted to be out of this ordeal. I want, I needed to be out of this ordeal. So, you must be, the only thing, like I say, and I repetitively say, is that God wants your willingness. He wants your faith. He wants your belief. And he will move mountains just to set you free. God doesn't want any of his children in captivity. He doesn't want any of his children in bondage. It hurts him. It really hurts him. That one you must know. It hurts God when his children. Think of God as a father all the time. If you see your, say you're a parent and you see your children in a very abusive relationship, you will not rest, but you will want to find a way for that child to get out. Even if it's constant prayers, even if it's reporting the case to the social workers or it's reporting the case to the police in terms of abuse, you will not rest until that child is set free. And when you do, you're like, ah, my child is free. Think of God that way. So even if your children don't see you fighting physically, that's now if you're as an adult and your children are in relationships and they don't see you fighting physically. You are fighting the spirit for those demons, those evil spirits to let your children go. So that's how you also need to be set free. So I'm so glad because this brings me almost to an end of my video on emotional and psychological abuse. I don't know what it will take in my case when i had to lose somebody which is my son for me to move out of this relationship because that was the one thing that kept me bonded to this person and i pray that you don't wait for something so tragic to happen before you realize you need to move sometimes your parents have been talking until they're blue in the face get out of that relationship it's not good for you and you don't listen. And then the parent dies. Then you realize, so my parent had to die for me to wake up. It must not come to that. You will have such regret in your life that it had to cost your parent's life. But sometimes that is a sacrifice that a parent, you know, or that's the, the act of God that would happen for your deliverance. That's what needs to probably happen for your deliverance, for you to wake up. 
I can confidently talk about my story because God delivered me. God delivered me. I think in the next video I'll be talking about healing. Probably the process of healing and understanding what healing is about. And like I said, I am no expert. I will only talk from my experience and I'll talk from what God has done for me in my life. I think I need to pray. So if you don't mind, just join me in prayer for a few seconds as I pray for anyone out there who may find themselves in a situation of oppression or bondage or any kind of abuse. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for your love and I thank you for your mercy. I thank you for your grace. I pray for your children, Heavenly Father, those who are watching this video now and those who are yet to watch this video. I pray for them, Father, to receive their deliverance. I pray for them to receive their healing. I pray for your mighty hand, Father, to deliver your children from the oppression of the wicked. Father, expose the evil deeds of the wicked. Bring them to their knees. Let the wicked know, Father, that you are the most high God, that you are the most supreme and most powerful God that ever was and ever will be. I pray, Father, that you visit all these people in their homes, those that are struggling in, 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 in relationships of abuse, spiritual abuse, um, physical abuse, um, emotional abuse. Those, those are your children, Father. I am asking, Father, for your hand of grace and your hand of mercy to deliver your Israelites out of the land of Egypt. Right now, they are feeling like they are choking in their relationships. They are feeling that they have no reason to live. They are feeling like they have no one to turn to. They are feeling like they have no place to go to. They are feeling like all they need to do is to wait and die. Father, you are a God of life. You said in your word, in Proverbs, Father, that you... That you, those who find you find life and receive favor from God. Your children are out there, Father, in captivity and they want to be re released. They want to be set free. Father, I'm asking you. I'm asking for your angels to move. I'm asking for your, your angels to move and deliver your children from the hand of the wicked. Shame and disgrace the wicked that have set traps for your children, that have in, that have caged their minds, that have caged their spirits, that have caged even th them physically in, in their homes or wherever they may be, that they cannot leave because they, the, the enemy wants to make themselves appear like they're God. Shame, Father, and disgrace the devil. You have done it before, Father. You can do it again. Do it again for your children, Father. Set them free. I want to thank you, Heavenly Father. I want to thank you because you are a merciful God. I want to thank you, Father, because you are a God of deliverance. I want to thank you, Father, because you are a God of peace. You are a God of joy. You are a God of progress. You are a God of multiplication. There is nothing that you cannot do. Father, your hand is not too short to save. Save your children, O oh God. Deliver your children from every form of abuse. I pray this in the mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Amen. And I hope, family, that that prayer has motivated you. I hope that that prayer has encouraged you. I normally cry when I really feel the power of God move. So um, if you're wondering what's up with her, yeah, this is what normally happens when I pray. I really feel the presence of God with such, with, with, with such power and compassion, especially for his children. God wants us to be happy. He wants us to live free lives. He wants us to roam and dominate this world. But we can't do that from a position of oppression. So this brings me to the end of my video. Thank you so much for those that watch my content. Please don't forget to like, comment, share, and subscribe to my channel to make sure that you don't miss any of this content that God has put in my heart to share with you. May, don't forget also to comment in the comment section below. I would love to hear your thoughts. I would love to hear your opinions. And, you know, let's share and spread this word. Let's help God's people be free. 
family it is a wonderful day like i said i'm so sorry about that driving it was really 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 annoying but um i wish you a very successful week ahead may god bless the works of your hands may god open doors for you may god shower blessings upon you and your family but more importantly may god give you nothing but peace and joy in your life and remember it doesn't come from material things it comes from the lord God Almighty. This is Intimate Conversations with Francis O'Brien, healing one heart at a time. I hope and I pray that you are blessed through this video. Have a wonderful week.